Semester two, final exam coming up. Let's get ready. So today I'm going to do the first installment and we're going to cover the circulatory system and blood. So to start out, we'll talk about the components of whole blood. So the majority you know is made up of plasma. So plasma is the liquid portion of blood. Um, it takes up about 55% of your overall blood volume. And um, its job is basically a medium of transport, so it's going to transport cells as well, well as nutrients and important proteins, um, clotting factors, antibodies, things like that, hormones. So it basically transports things. Um, it's also a medium for chemical reactions. Um, we also talked about the cellular component, so erythrocytes we know make up 45% of blood, so that's the next largest component. So erythrocytes, remember, are red blood cells. They carry oxygen, remember they carry a billion oxygen molecules each. Um, and then we talked about leukocytes, so leukocytes are your white blood cells. We talked about five different types of white blood cells. Um, in addition to the, um, the white blood cells, we have platelets. Platelets are the thrombocytes. So remember, thromb is clotting. So these are your clotting factors. Um, if you had an infection, you're going to expect an increase in white blood cells. Um, but if you were bleeding, you would expect platelets to accumulate at the site of injury. So we talked about blood typing and we identified that what determines your blood type is the type of antigen present on the surface of the blood cell. So remember antigens are proteins, they're markers, they identify self from non-self. Um, so you notice the little blue balls here on um, type A blood. So if you have the blue ball, the A antigen is present. Um, the purple spike is the B. Notice AB has both. Um, Type O blood has neither A or B. It does have an H, um, but we don't have antibodies against the H, so we don't worry about it. Um, <clears throat> according to Land Center's law, you have antibodies for the antigens you lack. So type A has the A antibody, but or I'm sorry, has the A antigen, but not the B. So the B is the spike, right? So notice the shape of this antibody would match that spike. So type A blood has B antibodies, type B blood has the A antibodies, they match the blue um, circle on the A. You have both antibodies, or I'm sorry, you have both antigens present on the AB blood, so you have no antibodies whatsoever. So this allows you to um, receive anybody's blood type. And then because you have neither A or B antibodies in type O blood, you have both the spikes and the circles, so you have both A and B um, antibodies. There's a third type of antigen that we have to worry about, and that's the RH factor. Uh, so if you have the RH factor, you're considered RH positive, so like I'm A plus, A positive blood, because I have the A antigen and the RH antigen. Um, and again, if you don't have the RH antigen, you can make RH antibodies after being exposed to it. So this page is on the genetics of blood typing. Um, over here you can see all the different genotypes. So like type A blood can have homozygous A, heterozygous A, and there's two different ways you could get heterozygous A. Um, so IAIA or IAI will both code for type A blood. <clears throat> and the same over here you see um, type B has three different forms, I guess, of the genotype. You can be homozygous for B, you got it from both parents, or maybe mom gave you B and dad gave you I, or maybe dad gave you B and mom gave you I. Um, if neither parent gives you an A or B, you have type O blood, so that's the only way you can get that is if you get two recessive alleles. A and B are codominant, so if they are both present, they both show. So you want to be able to do a Punnett square that has to do with blood typing. So if you were told that mom is heterozygous for type A blood, I'm going to do the shorthand, and dad is homozygous for type B, I could ask you what type of blood would the children have. So remember, you're going to bring the number letters down from up here. You're going to bring these letters across. So you have A, B, 
you have B O, haha, -ha. you have A P, and um, again B O. So there's two types of blood you can get. Isn't that interesting? That neither one get type A blood, but you can have A B blood or type B blood. I could also um, give you a child's genotype and say that they're homozygous for type A blood and could dad be type O. And so you'd have to work backwards, right? So you're going to take these letters out. And knowing that dad would have to have two, heteros, two uh, lowercase i's and there isn't any in the homozygous A, you know that that's not possible. So there is some blood donor compatibility that we have to worry about. So if you have the antibody that will attack the antigen, that would be a bad thing, right? Um, since type O blood has no antigens present whatsoever, nobody has an antibody that will attack type O blood. So type O blood is considered the universal donor because everyone can receive their blood. A, B, because they don't have any um, antibodies whatsoever, they can receive anybody's blood, so they're considered the universal receiver or recipient. Um, you only have to worry about the antibodies of the receiver, not of the donor. Um, so now you have to, oh, look at how I spelled baby. Funny. That's a typo. Uh, anyways, um, RH mothers who are a RH negative can have problems if they receive um, or if they have an Rh positive baby, right? Because they can make antibodies against the Rh positive baby's blood, and that would attack the baby. Remember that hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, the same thing is true with transfusion. You can get um, sensitized after being exposed to Rh blood, and so the second time an Rh negative person received Rh positive blood, they would um, have a transfusion reaction, and that would be bad. Some of you are going to be doctors. You're going to learn how to stitch people up when they get cut. Others, well, we at least need to know how to take care of an injury if we get one at home. So we talked about hemostasis, hemoblood stasis, standing still. So the, the act of blood clotting is hemostasis. Um, we're going to use gauze and pressure for a couple different reasons. Um, first of all, the gauze acts like your fibrin, your fi and fibrin is the protein threads that your body uses to um, make a mesh that's going to catch uh, red cells and whatnot from escaping through a cut. Um, so that's going to be the first step in, in like the actual sealing of the cut. And then we're going to fracture those thrombocytes with pressure. So we're going to uh, apply gauze and pressure, and the pressure serves the function of um, fracturing the platelets, so they release chemicals, ADP, thromboxane, that's going to attract other chemicals to the area or other platelets to the area so they can make more and more clot. So that's a positive uh, chemotaxis because they're coming to the chemicals. It's also a positive feedback loop, one of the few that we talk about. If you're an endurance sport, you're probably already familiar with the female triad. Uh, so the female triad begins with a, a lot of people want to say a disorder eating. It's disorder eating or overtraining. It's not getting enough nutrients for your body's needs. So you're not, um, oops, I hate when I do that. So you're not getting as much energy as your body needs, and so your body starts to break down itself. So it goes into survivor mode, and it turns off all those systems that your body doesn't need. And one of the systems your body isn't going to need if you're malnourished is your reproductive cycle. So um, so the first thing it's going to do is stop cycling hormones. So LH and FSH, which you don't need to know, um, are going to stop being released from the pituitary gland, which is going to tell your ovaries not to release an egg. And so it's not, also not going to release progesterone or an estrogen. And estrogen is needed for calcium uptake in your bones. So dun dun dun, dun osteoporosis, you get porous bones, osteobones, porous, porosity, really porous. Um, and they're brittle, and it's like you're 80 years old, but you're really only 16, and you fall down, and you get a broken bone, and oh, shoot, you're out of the game. So that's the disorder triad. 
One of the other issues in sports that we talked about was blood doping. So there's a couple different ways uh, blood doping can take place. Uh, the graphic we have down here shows how if you were to take blood out, you spin it through the centrifuge, separate out, um, you're going to inject back into your body the plasma, you're going to store the red cells maybe in a freezer, and then a couple days before the event, throw those puppies back into your body, and they can carry oxygen, and oxygen makes energy, and so now you have all kinds of energy. Um, the problem with that is you're adding extra red cells, which makes your blood viscous, which is thick. Um, so that's hard on your heart to pump that thick of blood. Um, the other way that you can um, blood dope is, is injecting EPO, which is going to then tell your body to make red cells and the same thing. You have too many red cells in your blood. Your blood is too thick. Here's all kinds of things that can happen because of blood doping. Um, so don't do it. So switching over into the circulatory system, what does your body do for you? Um, the circulatory system's main function is to deliver nutrients um, and export waste. It also delivers uh, hormones, so it allows chemical signaling between body parts. Um, it provides antibodies around your body um, to take care of infections. It provides heat. Like your muscles make the heat and your blood transports it throughout your body. Um, provides oxygen that's much needed for, for making energy. Let's see. What else does the blood do for you? Keeps you alive. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about the anatomy of the heart. So we're going to start with... Uh, pieces and parts and what they do. And then on the next slide, I have a picture so I can show you what I'm talking about. But um, let's start with the epicardium. So epi is above or upon. So that's the outer layer of the heart. It protects the heart. Myo means muscle. So that's where the actual contraction is taking place, the muscle layer of the heart. Endo within. So the inner lining of the heart is continuous with the uh, chordae tendine, the blood vessels, the valves. So it kind of anchors everything inside of uh, the heart. Atria, those are the upper chambers of the heart. They're receiving chambers, um, whether it's from the lungs or the rest of the body. It's going to receive blood. The ventricles are the lower chambers, so they're pumping chambers. So the right side is going to pump to the lungs, and the left side is going to pump to the, uh, the rest of the body. Bicuspid. By is two. Some way you got to remember that two is on the left side. It's also called the mitral valve. So between the atrium and the ventricles, so it's called an atrioventricular valve because it's between the two. Um, so any valve is going to prevent blood from flowing backwards. Um, tricuspid is on the right side of the heart between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So again, when the right ventricle is contracting, it's keeping blood from going back up into the right atrium. So here's a picture of the heart. Um, here, oops, sorry. Doo -doo -doo. We're going to enlarge this little section over here. So you can see the endocardium, real thin layer, the myocardium right here, the muscle layer, and then the um, epicardium is going to be way out here. So those are the three layers of the heart wall, which is what you see right there. Um, we talked about the valves. We talked about the bicuspid valve over here, the tricuspid valve over here. And I think that's all we've talked about so far. Um, on the next slide, we're going to start talking about the, um, the arteries and veins. The largest of all your vessels is the aorta. It leaves the left ventricle and delivers blood to the heart itself as well as all the rest of your body. The pulmonary artery, all arteries take blood away from the heart. So the pulmonary artery is taking blood to the lungs. It is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood. All the rest of them carry oxygenated blood. We have the superior vena cava at the top of the heart, the inferior vena cava also going into the right atrium but bringing blood from the lower part of the body instead of the superior brings it from the upper part of the body. 
Um, we have three different types of vessels that we talked about. Arteries, um, further branch into arterioles, which further branch into capillaries, which come together into venules, which come together into veins. So the largest of those are arteries, and you want to know the difference between arteries and veins. So in this picture over here, we can see that the artery has a thicker wall than the vein does. Um, and then because it has a thicker wall, it's going to have less space in its lumen than uh, the vein it has a larger lumen because it has a thinner wall. Um, you can also see that valves are in the veins where they are not in the arteries. And then we can look at the capillaries, and the capillaries are only one layer thick, and that's the tunica intima, so the innermost layer, the endothelium. Um, and so that makes them a perfect place for diffusion of gases. Okay, that first picture was the internal um, heart, and this is the external heart. I forgot to mention the atria, the receiving chambers, and the ventricles on that first picture. Um, in this picture, we want to look at the aorta, which is the largest artery, the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary veins, the superior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava. That's my cat, Snowy. We talked about three different types of circulations. The first circulation that we talked about was the coronary circulation. So leaving the left ventricle and then servicing the heart tissue itself, feeding that muscle, that would be the, um, the coronary circuit. The pulmonary circuit is going to leave the right ventricle, go to the lungs, drop off CO2, pick up oxygen, and come back to the right vent or I'm sorry, the left ventricle. And then the third circulation um, is the systemic circuit. So it's it's servicing all of your systems, your body systems. Um, so that's going to, again, leave out the left ventricle and then go out to your hepatic system, your renal system, all of your different body systems until it comes back and returns to the vena cavas in the right atrium. We had some fun this year learning how to take our blood pressure with a sphygmo manometer, sphygmo mananometer, and um, we had to learn what the systolic and the diastolic pressures were and what they meant, what they represented. So systole is when the ventricle is contracting. So you see here, look at the ventricles, they're like squished in. So that's the systolic pressure, typically around 110. And then diastole, look at the ventricles, how much fuller they are. So they're filling up with blood at this point. Could be around 70. Um, we see the general blood pressure is 120 over 80, meaning your systolic pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury, and your diastolic pressure is 80. Um, of course, it's going to vary with your age, your weight, your mood, um, your body's position, your exercise activity levels. Um, all of those things can cause that number to change. The doctors are going to use a stethoscope to listen to your heart um, and is also going to use it down here when um, listening for that pulse in your vessels when they're taking your blood pressure. So um, a stethoscope is used for listening and a sphygmo manometer is used for measuring pressure. So they use a sphygmo manometer to measure your blood pressure. We did a little math. People weren't too excited about the math. Um, we did cardiac output, which is the amount of blood your body will deliver in a minute. So in order to calculate that, we need your stroke volume, which is how much is delivered in a single beat, and we need your heart rate, which is how many times your beat per it, how many time your heart beat in a minute. So if we multiply those two together, we are going to increase or find our cardiac output. So anything that increases your heart rate, like exercise, um, or your stroke volume is going to increase your cardiac output as well. Here you can see a number of things that can factor in your age, your gender, 
exercise, different medications, your stress levels, um, if, you're, if your vessels are constricting due to your sympathetic nervous system or if they're dilating, that's going to affect your, um, the amount of blood that can leave the heart with each beat. Uh, so any of those things can affect your cardiac output. You want to be able to calculate cardiac output. So remember, heart rate times stroke volume. So one of the things we talked about was hypertension. Hypertension, um, high blood pressure, hyper high tension pressure. So if your blood pressure is over 140, over 90, that would be considered um, hypertensive and, it, and you're at risk for heart disease. It's really hard on the heart muscles to work to push blood when it's that high of a pressure, as well as it causes damage to your blood vessels. So it's considered the silent killer. Um, what kind of things cause it? If you're, as you can see down in this graphic here, uh, too much stress, overweight, different um, diseases that you might have, an unhealthy diet with too much salt, um, smoking, which we know is a vasoconstrictor, different um, hereditary effects, um, alcohol, age, all those things can play into um, hypertension. Somewhat unrelated to hypertension is your average heartbeat. So we just want to know some statistics. Um, your, the average heart rate is like 72. So it's somewhere between 60 and 80. And then your blood or your heart typically um, pumps out about 80 milliliters of blood per minute. You would want to know that because you can multiply your um, heart rate times your stroke volume to get, you said it, cardiac output. So that's all I have for you for today. So that's part one. It covered the, um, the blood just a little bit and the circulatory system a little bit more. Um, so that's all I got for you for now. We'll talk about the immune system next. Have a good night.